as a powerlifting coach and a strength coach, that's wrong. You really consider yourself a special strengths coach. Could you? Uh, yes, I believe. That? Yes, I think I'm a, a, speed, a special strength coach. I know what explosive strength is, speed strength. You know how to develop strength endurance, how to develop endurance in a fatigue state, how to develop absolute strength. And most coaches don't. They call themselves a speed strength coach, but yet they don't know the velocity of speed strength. So uh, next question would be how, uh, let's go through, uh, let's just keep it to f uh, football for the most part. What, uh, could you explain the differences in your feeling between strength, speed, speed, strength, and how they relate to football players by position? So, Well, of course, uh, you have to be explosive, and that's the fastest rate of strength in as short as possible time. And you have to have speed strength, of course, to accelerate. Uh, but then linemen have to be absolutely strong, and that's where strength speed or slow strength will come involved when two linemen collide at the line and fight each other for a second or two while someone's running around the end. Okay. And incorporating the Olympic lifts, would you have all of the athletes train the same way? Um, in Olympic lifting? I would not do yeah. Olympic lifting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's too fast, it's too dangerous. It's too technical. You want to be a good football player, or a good Olympic weightlifter. You have to make a. You can't have being a half ass. Mm -hmm. Olympic lifting is too fast. Like I said before, talking to you gentlemen before, mm -hmm. force is developed in four tenths of a second. But after four tenths, can you, you can you maintain force? Mm -hmm. And Olympic lifting cannot. Olympic lifting is primary a deceleration. You jump underneath the bar all the time. Mm -hmm. Even in squat, you basically fall down and bounce up. So only Olympic lifting, and Olympic lifting is it was a common to see people do slow eccentrics because there's no eccentric phase in Olympic lifting. Without, without that, the, the stretch reflex is the key. Why do Olympic lifters always do hand cleans? Because that's where the stretch reflex is set up. If Olympic lifting would, would work, you would just do the power cleans off the floor. But you have to set stretch reflex, reversal strength. Reversal strength. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, could you explain... Uh uh, reversal strength and starting strength and how you would relate that to American football? Well, um, well, reversal strength is basically when you watch two centers jump for the ball, they bob, bob, jump, you know, and uh, that would be reversal strength. In, in, in lifting weights, uh, a modified dive or, or a, you know, or a dive where you dive down, grab the bar and lift it up or drop down, drop down, set time pull, set the stretch the reflex. And um, I've done experiments with football. I know you're going to ask me about box squatting. And I did experiments. Uh, Wilson had studies in uh, over in Australia that anyone's stress reflex retained for two 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 seconds, and highly skilled athletes to four. Here with a two, Tendo unit, we proved it stays to eight, and that was on myself. And I was old then; I was in my fifties. But um, I could sit on a box for eight seconds and get up at, at the same rate of speed concentrically as I did a normal box squat. Dave Tate, who is extremely explosive. Um, we were roughly the same strength. Dave had a 935 squat in the 308s. I had 920 weighing 235, officially. And uh, Dave was super explosive. He could stay down for five seconds. The quicker, the more explosive you are, of course, it would diminish faster. And that's what you're recruiting football. One of my pet peeves is I mentioned to the guys that uh, strength in football, you recruit speed and quickness. But yet that's all you want to train once they get there. You have to train what they don't have. You spoke to us earlier about the overtraining aspect that, that you've seen with a lot of strength and conditioning programs. Mm -hmm. Can you give us your concerns with that and how you would change that as a strength and conditioning coach? All right, I'm going to send back papers with you guys, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a, an article called a multi-year training system, basic for Olympic cycle, but college, college sports is Olympic cycle, four years. And, it, 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 and I did this, it took a person from 400 Squat to a thousand pound squat in four years. Actually, this young this, this kid was a 16 and a 19 squat, a thousand five. The only teen ever to do that. And um, if you look at if you look at a 400 pound squatter, he trains it from 50 to 60 percent with some accommodating resistance the, for three week weights. The first week 12 week, the second week 12, the third week 10. Um, and um, like a um, and if you look at that, so that's a two a 400 pound squatter would train from 200 to 240. If you look at 240, if you got team players that squat 240, if they did 10 doubles, uh, they would be doing 4,800 pounds of work because the 10 doubles, 240 times 2 is 480 times 10 sets is 4,800. If you look at a gentleman like Ross here, it, long years ago squatted 800, 
an 800 pound squatter would train between 400 and 480. All right, he squats twice as much as a 400 pound squatter. And as uh, the training weights would be uh, 400 to 480, 480 times two reps is um, 960 times 10 sets is 9,600, exactly twice as much as a 400 pound squatter. Training must be monitored mathematically. This keeps you from overtraining. That's why I could bring a, a, a young child in here squats 400 and train with my guys that squat 1100 and never overtrain. The rest periods for football, you two gentlemen just went through this. I recommend 40 second rests in between sets. Uh, football is a two, four to second, four to seven second play in college, slightly faster than the pros, you well know. So uh, the two repetitions represent a play, the 40 seconds represents the rest between plays. Uh, it did treat it like a game clock. Before you hit 40, you had to be squatting. I normally do 12 doubles the first week, 12 doubles, 10 doubles. So that's essentially like 12 plays. And after that, they, they ran over and they did 6 to 10 doubles in the deadlift, the sumo-style deadlift, to teach you when you learn to squat properly, you never push your feet down, you push them out. It automatically builds lateral speed, glutes, and hamstring strength. Eliminate hamstring pulls, increases lateral speed. And uh, that's why we do it that way. But at that point, if you did 10 squats, 10 deads, that's 20, pull, that's 20 plays on a football field. And then we, for conditioning, we would go outside and do the prouder pushes. Um, 10 seconds all out, 40 second rest from 10 to 20. And if they need power strength-wise, it would be power walking uh, to develop the posterior chain. But uh, a couple years ago, I had five players in the N uh, NBA, uh, Big Ten here, all different schools. And they said that was equivalent to playing more than half a football game. And it takes roughly 20 minutes, 25 minutes, we'll say. We were talking <clears throat> earlier, sorry, about uh, Missouri and some of their uh, stages of training, how they and uh, got into the conjugate method. And you were talking about uh, David Hoff, how he's trained with you since he's been 15. Uh, so you believe that, and we're, gonna start, we're not saying a brand new beginner, but a kid that has basic foundation uh, and technique in those three lifts, he can begin to use the conjugate method. You believe that is Beth best right from the start. If you read Texas, they say the conjugate method it was defined for advanced athletes. I believe there's only one way to train, the right way and the wrong way. I believe you start off the conjugate system. In the very beginning, conjugate system is not even a GPP. Pulling sleds, doing push-ups, doing chin-ups, uh, rope climbing, for instance, doing bounding, doing jumping, box jumping, and so forth. Abdominal work, flexibility work, mobility work, dexterity work, that should be play a, a base. I've mentioned before that a pyramid is only as tall as its base. If a child doesn't have a wide athletic base, he's not going to be a very good athlete. So when it comes to uh, college um, American football, you believe that a um, 19-year-old kid can begin to safely use uh, box plus with bands, chains, begin to do dynamic effort work if his technique and form is coached up correctly. I started at 13. That's why they're paying you to be a coach, yeah. You know, they pay people to be a coach, to learn technique and, and, and procedures, and I start people here at 13 years old. Never heard a 13-year-old, I've never heard, uh, no one's ever got hurt. Um, I've got a little track girl I mentioned to you fellows, 15 years old, uh, 115 pounds. She ran a 461 seconds, and uh, she could deadlift 185, and she box jumped 36. In four months, she deadlifted 285, sumo style deadlift, 225 for 17, um, and she box jumped 44, and she ran 56.83 at Miami University for a trial. Um, a 15-year-old girl could do it. 19-year-old uh, freshman in college should be able to do this. Lots of power walking with sleds, lots of bell squat, like I, I showed you fellows. You can go back and build up the glutes and the hamstrings. A lot of GPP, I wanted to broaden her base. I had Mo Robinson here years ago, Olympic gold medalist in the 400. And so I just look at Mo as a model athlete, and I, 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 her name is Jasmine Green, and I try to develop Jasmine Green into Mo Robinson. Could you talk a little bit about your uh, box jumps uh, that you've been using with football players? You've had great success on. Could you go into those? And do you use those? Uh, obviously, in, in football, we have to do movement skill, so we have to take that stressor into into aspect with also our strength development. So where where would you put that aside in that in, in a training 
of football athlete? There's a couple ways. Uh, Paul Childers, who you know, a huge 225-pound guy, Paul actually would do box jumps as a warm-up before a workout. And Paul was a coach out of Buffalo. And uh, so there's many ways to do it. I believe in resistance box jumping. For combat sports, you must use resistance. Um, I use the same procedure as A.S. Primland's weight charts. If you look at him, he, he prescribed uh, weights at 70%, um, 12 to 24 lifts, weights at 80%, 10 to 20, weights at 90%, um, um, 4 to 7. All right, we normally do the optimals, which is dead in the middle of these, and I use uh, I use weights. So if a person could jump on a 40-inch box and I wanted to train at 80, 80% um, of 40 would be 32 inches. All right, they would normally do maybe slightly higher for, for explosive power, up to 30 jumps, normally between 20 and 30 jumps, and uh, they would use a variety of anchor weights, 5, 10s, and 20s, um, weight vests up to 125, dumbbells up to... Uh, 70s. I told you my, my friend John Stafford, 832 deadlift, would do sets of fives, uh, around five sets of five with 70 pound dumbbells on a 36. He could uh, reach up and touch a, a little bit over around 11.6. That's a foot and a half higher than a basketball rim, and he had no athletic ability at all, but a, but super explosive. That's what I claim. I don't claim to make an athlete. I claim to make a more explosive athlete. Um, so we rotate the jumps every time. You could have a record with. A um, 125-pound weight vest on a 24-inch box, we'll say, trying to raise an inch at a time. Always train optimally. Try not to let the fellows miss. And, but the next time you come in, you change the box. That's the conjugate system. Next time we might use heavy, dumb, uh, heavy dumbbells, heavy weight vests, heavy ankle weights. You get records in all sorts. So after th a three-week wave, wave with weights, at three weeks, you'll never get any stronger, never get any faster. Take all the resistance off and just check their box jump. I prefer jumping over Olympic weightlifting. Because that is explosive power. Jumping is defined as explosive power. If you look at the World Atlas of Track and Field Exercises or Explosive Power and Jumping Ability, it says just that. And um, uh, also I was mentioning Dr. Verfashinsky, who you know about, and several other coaches, uh, tremendous uh, in the plyometric and explosive power field. In their books, you do not see Olympic lifting. You see jumping off the knees. I'm huge jumping off the knees with weights. Um, First of all, you set on the floor. I'll describe how this goes. I'm coming. I've got a tape. I have to have edited for all coaches. It's a coaching guide I'm coming out with. Sit on the floor and press overhead. That develops all the muscles for running and jumping. Secondly, get down on the knees. Jump onto your feet like you did. Thirdly, pick a barbell, and you work up. Let's say a goal of 135 pounds. And once you start to, you know, when you get to that, to put a barbell across your thigh, jump into a power clean, off the knees. When you master that, jump into a power snatch. And for very athletic work, because it's repetition, you jump into a split snatch, which no one does anymore. Jump into a split, drop back down, split the other leg, drop back down, split the other leg. Um, I trained a, a fellow, John Harper, in high school. He got uh, he threw 170 in high school discus. He could jump onto his knees with 170 on his back. He he has done two at the time. He had done 265 when he, in college. He weighed uh, 265. He could get down on his knees with 265 on his back and jump onto his feet. He uh, throws around two, 210 right now in college. As that went up, that was a straight indicator how far the discus would go up. Just like the shot put, but people, the better they push your behind the head, it's a straight indicator they can throw farther. That's why we use the conjugate system, as you know, where there's builders and testers. Like, for instance, if I steep incline more and did a heavy jam, my bench press was, was up. You might, if you pull off pin two in a power rack or pin three, you know your deadlift off the floor is up. You've got, you've got developers and you've got builders. That way uh, you, you don't have a psychological bearing of always going in and trying to defeat the same enemy. And the body runs on 23-day clocks, if, it, if everyone knows this. So if you look at a three-week wave, it almost coincides with that, minus having someone come in and test you because it doesn't matter if we did it properly. The game time might be, it might be on your optimal high. But it should be three week ways. Coach, can you talk to us a little bit about how you monitor recovery in your athletes? Well, recovery is easy. Uh, people many times, you know, uh, ask me about drug use and they ask me about training uh, uh, young children. They ask me about training women. We have the strongest of all of these things in the world. I have the strongest woman pound for pound. I'm probably the strongest old man pound for pound. Um, we have the strongest gym uh, of all gyms. And none of this matters because... If, like I said, if I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, a 400 squatter does so much volume, a 500 squatter does so much volume, a 1,000 pound squatter, it keeps you from overtraining. I'm not asking you, you know, you go out and you'll take your top athlete, expect the rest of the team to follow them. That's overtraining. I do it mathematically. 
Um, weight training is mathematics, physics, and biomechanics. So when you understand those three, you know, proper, proper technique and so mm -hmm. forth, um, the rest is, is, is uh, it's limitless what you can do. And when you, uh, like if you're a 400 squatter, you have to move the bar about 0.8 meters if you use tendos, which we don't. We know what all this is. I, it's the first one in America to use a tendo. And uh, so, and he squats 600, he would still move his bar 0.8 meters per second. How do you gain 50 pounds? Of, for every 50 pounds that you gain in a squat, if you look at the chart I give you, you'll see you, your volume goes up 600 pounds, straight up in, to infinity. Um, and uh, you get started by doing max effort exercises. The heavy, hard, uh, out of the groove exercises make you strong. And the sp with the speed on one day and the strength on the other, that's how you race. Um, from a standpoint of uh, time in the college setting, uh, and we talked about this, your guys don't train for a long time, and we were talking about this at breakfast. Uh, coming from competitive powerlifting, I said most of my workouts, I, don't, I like to be out of there in 45 minutes. So take a dynamic effort uh, method squat for a football player at the beginning of three-week wave. Would you still recommend, you would still recommend 12, say 12 doubles? And for a football player who's in a strength, train for strength, speed, or speed strength at that time, how long should that approximately take? So, you got a clock, 40 seconds, <laughs> and for speed strength, uh, you know, strength speed is going to be slightly slower. And um, but you know, you guys did it. You guys did, you did 10 doubles every 40 seconds. So that's two thirds of at six minutes and. You know, slightly over six minutes for 10 sets of squats. The deadlifts are 30 seconds. They did sets, so that's three minutes, that's 13 minutes. And if you want to do 10 prior approaches, it's 23 minutes. You've got plenty of time for box jumps, or you've got plenty of time for anything else. You know, the Bulgarian weightlifters were the most successful of all. They had nothing but model athletes. I had the weightlifting team doctor for the Olympic weightlifting team spend time here. And the, basically, their workouts lasted 45 minutes. That's where serum testosterone was as high. Would, would just, fall as they take a short period and they would come back and do another workout like that. Well, we're not Bulgarian weightlifters and that's the problem in America. Everyone thinks they are and we don't have anyone who can clean a Bulgarian gym. That's why we're not model athletes. You're trying to be a weightlifter at six foot two and you should be five foot two. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people all the time I love basketball but I'm not in the NBA. There's a good reason for it. Yeah. So that, that, um, that monitoring training and how fast. So like I said, see, at that point you could do box jump. You could come back for a second workout and do jumping as well. When I train football players for combine, um, I bring, they come in, they normally squat, they'll come back in a second, then they'll go out there and do football drills. They do not run. Nobody ever runs here. But they'll go do lineman drills, linebacker drills, whatever your position is, uh, DB drills, whatever that is. I have no idea, but that's what they do. But then they come back at night and we do the jumping, the battling, change, conditioning, or, and power walking. The power walking is essential to success. And one way to conduct, I had a Ohio State football player. Uh, you may meet him tonight to verify this. I had him two, month, two weeks, I mean two months. He didn't want to train the football team. He wanted to train here. And so I had to go up and see the line coach. And the line coach told me, says, I had to have him back in football condition. He's doing, he's going to do an internship here. I says, I'll send him back in better shape than anyone on your team. Never ran him in two months. And one thing, uh, he did exactly what I said, plus a lot of power walking. A lot of box jumping, but one thing we did, and I got this from um, um, uh, rugby teams from overseas. Um, I would put a 125-pound weight boss vest on him and many others, 20-pound ankle weights and Indian clubs or kettlebells, and I'd send him out for a half mile to two and a half miles. They thought that was the greatest conditioning I've ever done. He went back. There was two two players on the line test, whatever the, you know the conditioning test. He was one or two to pass. Didn't run one time in two months. You just you run ball players in the ground. I mean, you know, you can turn the tape off now, but this is my theory. You know, no, I'm saying, don't turn the tape off. No, all of you. Um, football is four to seven seconds. It's not gassers. Why do you see guys run gassers all the time, and a defensive end picks up a fumble, runs 20 yards, and passes out in the end zone? So much for the gassers. You're trained to wrong energy sources. Football's a knock your ass out, back up, knock you out, back up, knock you out, back up. Knock. The harder, many times you can do that, the more successful you'll be. You're building endurance athletes. When you run them, you're taking explosive athletes and turning them into endurance athletes. That's one thing. Uh, I've been reading about and uh, studying, uh, with, uh, especially with throwers, uh, begin to working with throwers there at Purdue, and uh, 
one thing I started seeing on a lot of Russian texts that you did see in a lot of American stuff was uh, power endurance. They uh, talk about, uh, uh, you know, and I've talked to the throwers how they might have to go 20, 30 minutes in between throws due to a meet, very similar to powerlifting. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that since there's not a lot of American text on that, on power endurance, your thoughts on that outplay to football, <coughs> athletics in general? Well, that's exactly why I want you to do the short rest periods. Because if you had a tendo to prove it, uh, you would see his 12 set was, did you not feel your 12, your 10 set was just as explosive as the first? Oh, yeah. You start raising weight, you know, where you're using like two and a quarter in a 140 pound of band, you're going to run people off the field. Um, i talked to coaches, NFL people about this, NFL strength coaches, and they agree with me 100% that what I say would be, I said, you could run a play every 20 seconds. They, but they, they said the problem would be the coaches couldn't get the plays in. But that's not my fault. I did my job. <laughs> you know, like a guy, you get a, I noticed one thing about MMA, it's all offense. And they'll kick your ass for three five-minute rounds or five five-minute. There's, It's not like boxing. You're not leaning up against rope. You're not running. It's all out force aggression. That's what football is. There's nothing general on a football field. Like I said, football is a max effort sport. So no one can tell me you shouldn't do max effort exercises. Football is max effort. You don't do anything. If you did something easy on a football field, you'd jerk them off the field, right? You don't run as fast, tackles hard, you're jerked off the field. It's all max effort. People tell me, you know, they, they argue, many people say, well, Lou, you're a pilot coach. You know, all you want to do is strength, strength, strength. And I told these guys, that I, when I, I, I've been to the Green Bay Packers, I've been to Seattle, you know, you guys have been everywhere. But when I was at uh, as, uh, Green Bay, and then I had to go to Brown's camp over and over and over when Davis was there, uh, I, I said, oh, football players are fast. Yeah, I hear that all the time. When I was out there 10 feet from and saw how fast football players are, it hit me in the head. I realized, Jesus, these guys are really fast. I've never seen anybody run and turn that fast. People don't understand the how strong people, what strength can do to people. It can nullify technique many, many times. People don't understand what superior strength is. Why? Because they don't have it. I didn't have the running speed. They don't have the strength. Can you expand on what we talked about in terms of learning to turn the right muscles on at the right time? Yeah, I know mean, the combined chain is the way it works. Uh, like, you, you know, what, what, I told, I, what I simply say, I always say this because everybody gets it. If I walked up and smacked you in the face, You'd block it 10,000 times. I do it over. I practice blocker, blocker, blocker. So when you lift, the, and for squatting, the lower back and glutes and hips and hamstrings have to be strong. So you take a weight out your ass. Out, you have to stick your ass out and arch your back. If you're standing in limbo, don't know which way to go forward or backwards, I'm sure you've seen, you got problems. And uh, in the, in the bench press the arms, when you take the bar down, you got to start with your arms. If you start with your pecs, you're going to tear a pec off. So you got to build the right muscles, and that builds coordination and makes the body work efficiently. It's very, it's very important to have the right muscle, the strongest. When uh, you get the, if you're super strong in the front, you're going to sit forward and squat, and you're going to get injuries. If you're set uh, super strong in the back, you set to the back, right? So, can you go on that? Uh, we, we just need to simplify it a little bit. Could you go on that and say, so when we are training a squat for uh, American football or athletics, our primary emphasis in that is to build. The muscles of the hips, glutes, and hamstrings, correct? And lower back. back. Lower back. Uh, when you build up the lower back, mm -hmm. which everyone seems to be afraid of, you will eliminate hamstring pulls. Now, can you, you talked to her earlier, and you had us doing some uh, sled stuff for the upper or for the lower back, uh, and you talked about the uh, lower back was primarily an endurance area. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, lower back, uh, migrant workers uh, pick pick fruit and peanuts and. You name it, every day of their life, they never had back problems. They bend over, you know, put it in a basket, bend over, bend over, bend over. They don't have back problems. The lower back basically is comprised of the ligaments and tendons. You tear a muscle against black and blue. You hurt your lower back and southern river. I've never seen a black and blue lower back. Why? Because nothing but ligaments and tendons. Ligaments and tendons have small blood supply. So you have to pump blood into them all the time. Now, that's why we use reverse hypers all the time. A lot of sled dragging. Um, and we showed you exercises for the wrestling team where we do a lot of um, good mornings with the head harness. And slow, methodical, like that. It builds from the neck all the way down to the tailbone of you. You know, what you felt in the upper back, and that tells me your upper back is weak. Okay. Like uh, Jeff, he was squatting and fall down like his glutes won't fire in the bottom. And, and you know, I noticed that right off. But I did leg presses three times this week because I broke my lower back twice. I never feel my freaking legs. I feel it all in the hips. It's just I came in reverse. 
You know, so that's what I was, I mean, that's what I know. I know what's wrong with you because I know what's wrong with me. <laughs> so, so you got to build, I mean, I just try to hit them all the time until I finally get them to work somewhat. Yes, sir. <laughs> we see a lot of stuff now where there's a lot of moving to single leg movements. And part of the justification for a single leg movement is it bypasses the core and the lower back because that's the weakest area. So you can overload the legs without the core and lower back fatiguing, which would seem to me counterintuitive because it is. But there, it's become very popular in our profession. Very popular and no evidence to prove it works. The Bulgarian weightlifting coach is here. He asked me questions. Why does Americans want to squat on one leg when they can't squat on two? And that's my, my theory. You know, when one leg's off the ground, that's that's a, that's a chaos. <laughs> it's at both feet on the ground. That's where balance. Foot's off the ground, you have no balance. And their, their theory sounds uh, illogical, except, like you said, they're bypassing the area that needs to work. Why would you do that? Why would you bypass what needs to work? How about training a little bit? Um, power, if you look at sprinters, they got rectors crazy, look like 800 pound deadlifters. They, the, comparably, they don't pull very many hamstrings. I got a call, I mean, you know, so whoever it was I talked to, when the Jets, when the Giants played in the Super Bowl a few years ago, I get a call on Sunday, it's the Giants. So I go, what, don't you guys have a ball game? They're laughing at me, you know. They go, well, get some hyper, reverse hypers. I said, okay. So I asked you a question. I said, you guys train your hamstrings all the time? He says, yep. I said, you pull them all the time, right? He goes, yeah. I said, you stretch them all the time? They go, yes. I said, you pull them all the time, right? And he says, yeah. I said, you ever train your lower back? They go, nope. I said, that's why you pull hamstrings. It's as simple as that. It's all connected. It's where they connect. You have a nerve, and you have the sacral nerve runs from the top of the goop right all the way down and through. When that muscle is not conditioned or stretched or strong, it will pull a hamstring. Did you go into some uh, exercises you feel that are uh, best for those? Sacral for, ligament. For uh, um, football players, wrestlers, combat athletes for training a uh, little back. Uh, just some... Ones that we could use in a collegiate setting? Well, okay. For uh, Of course, reverse hyper, just regular standard back raises, like good mornings for high reps, like good morning staggered. We do, uh, I train, I have a lot of MMA guys stop by and wrestlers, I mean, uh, guys in the world, Greco and, and freestyle team. And I have them do walking good mornings. And uh, they'll step out, it will, normally you say squat bar, step out, bend all the way down to where their, um, their chest almost touches their knees, stand back up and step out again. They never bring their feet even. They have to step out every time, all right? But it's a, it's a tremendous conditioner. I'll take you guys out. It would absolutely kill you. I had professional rugby players come here. It got down to that fire thing, and we had to go bring it back. A 220-pound guy from overseas. I mean, it's rough. Only MMA guys can ever go down and bring it back. Maybe hit, hit too many times in the head, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's grueling. And that, that's how we do it. And like you said, the sled dragging in general, if you drag enough laps with the sled, you'll start to notice your lower back is pumping up. M many people while you're on sled dragging, people ask me, why don't you run with the sled? Read a freaking book. It says if you run with resistance, you distort running form. Mm -hmm. I've been to Bassett, invented the parachute, but he said it distorts running form. It takes you out of balance. He invented it on a thing. Um, why do I walk with the sled? Because every step is a start. It eliminates deceleration. You notice when you walk with sled properly, you feel the jerk. Jerk. Every step is a start. If you go 60 yards, which I recommend for football and short sprints, from their recommendations, sprinters and football players, uh, the last step has to be as strong as the first step. If you did 10 trips of 60 yards, the very last step of ten, the 10th has to be as, as strong as the first one. The first. <coughs> you mentioned how you know your combat athletes don't experience many shoulder injuries despite being constantly thrown to the ground or being in a compromised position, the shoulder girdle. Can you explain why you feel that they don't experience as many injuries as your typical athletes? Well, improper weight training, even mm -hmm. though, you know, I don't think the bench press is outside of putting muscle on someone to keep them, cushion them for being hurt as a good thing, but they do lots of, you know, they do a lot of kettlebell cleans and presses. Uh, they do a lot of battling ropes and chains. I do a lot of battling chain here, a lot of Indian clubs, mm -hmm. and a lot of bag training where they'll swing bags in their hands, mm -hmm. and I'll have you guys do this. I'll show you if you've never done it, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe that's why. Okay. And, uh, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense that they don't have labor injuries, and football players do. Mm -hmm. okay. So you believe those exercises, uh, Indian clubs, ropes, things like that will help... Uh 
reduce uh, labrum, the rash of injuries in American football? <clears throat> Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Now, one thing about Olympic lifting, when I did have fighters here, like I had Kevin Randleman, he would use 225. He would power clean it, but I would not let him touch his body anywhere. Drop it to a hang, hang clean it, push press it. He did 225 um, every 30 seconds for 10 minutes. That's a conditioning drill, but that's more or less for your wrestlers, okay? But I never let him touch the bar. You know, barbells, you know, you make a barbell cooperate and, and, and your opponent's not going to cooperate with you. So I would never let them, if I did Olympic lifting, it would look terrible. It, 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 they never touch a bar, but you'll be, you'll be strong as hell. You, you would become strong and not technical. Can you talk to us about the grip strength that you mentioned to us earlier this morning? Well, well basically, I get my most, my grip strength comes from batting chains. I like the chains. Mm -hmm. I rope, I use a batting rope for a minute 15. Mm -hmm. I'm 63 years old. I don't have that much time. I could do, now I could do a batting rope for three hours for money. <laughs> I went to a big rope because my friends are my buddies in National Judo Coast for seven years. They so get big ropes because that's better for risk control. 50 minutes and, you know, so I'm coasting through that. So I went to half inch chain. And normally what I do, I do a couple bouts of 15 minutes at a time. And I, and I, I pretty much do it like this, standing up. I do it like this. This is about the cadence I use. I pull them to me. I hammer curl them like this. But turn my wrist like this. The bigger rotation you make, the greater the will work on rotators. And they work as traction. Same thing. People don't understand any club works as you have centrifugal force with any club. So it tractions out the joints as you, as you build um, range of motion and pump blood into the soft tissue. And uh, uh, the fighters, one of the best ways, believe it or not, like Carl Gotch, a famous fighter, if you ever heard of him, but he was famous, most famous in Japan. And uh, he would take wet newspaper, set it on a table, and just pull the wet paper. You got to have strong fingers. If you start doing wrist curls, you get bigger forearms, fatter hands, and a worse grip. You have to train your fingers. All right? I do a lot of stuff in gravel. You know, you can start with bird feed. Put, put your hand through bird feed and open and close it. It's opening in it. If you take your own hand, you can squeeze it hard, but you can't open it up. So you, you want to learn to open up your hand to build closing strength. And we got grippers. You notice our gripper. A lot of guys use it. They pick up hex dumbbells like this. And, of course, we, we don't use straps very often. You know, we seldom ever use straps to do anything, so we're just grabbing them at the bars. And um, a lot of things, if you, uh, like, judo players and samba have geese. And they have the greatest grips of all, all and because they got grab onto the gi. So, take, so you know, you guys play with sandbags and stuff. Mm -hmm. Get it where they have to grab on and pick it up like that now to build a grip if they need grip. Mm -hmm. uh, very intriguing. Hey, Hugh's going to be... Uh, a question I'm going to come from this angle. It's probably a little controversial. Uh, t talking about Olympic lifting, we know you're not a huge fan of it. In our profession, especially with, uh, American football, may come down from a head coach, just from that old football, like you were talking about the grandmother, wanting a test from a hand clean, you know, from a football coach, uh, wanting to test the hand clean, wanting to see those numbers. How would you go about increasing them? those numbers, not from a technical, from a strength standpoint. You mean to actually, if I had to, stronger. If, you if, had if, to do if it. this is an Olympic weightlifting gym, I'd be the no, strongest Olympic weightlifting gym in the world, like I am power, but how would I do it? They would do poles with bands, they would do poles with chains, uh, they would do straight leg power cleans, um, straight leg power snatch, they would do heavy back extensions. I watched Juan Marbaz and Anouski get to 70 world championships, he's a 6'8 Olympian, and uh, from Poland, 148 do five reps in the back raise of 2 and 25. Lots of glued hams, lots of reverse hypers, lots of good mornings. Um, and if you, I'm one of my ball players, you know, uh, I'd make him push press. I think that's one of the things. They do a little bit do too many push presses, right? I make him do push presses. And uh, push press from, my, from the front, push press from the back. And I would use, every time I did it, they'd have to use a different grip. The next workout, they're using a snatch grip, this close grip. Um, I'd make them do power cleans. Power snatches down on four inch boxes to, increase, to, to contribute to keeping legs in the lift longer. That's what the Soviets did, that's what I would do. We can't match what they did in 1970s, today. We've gone nowhere. Our last world record before they changed weight classes was 1969, as far as I know, Joe Doobie. We've gone nowhere. Uh, my pet peeve, coach, is uh, uh, if you go to a weightlifting contest, it's like going to a golf match. Everybody's telling you to be quiet. And uh, when I go to a football game, you can't hear yourself talk. If you go to a power meet, you can't hear yourself talk. 
you got crazy people doing crazy things. That's what I want my athletes. I want some psychological warfare going on when I lift weights. You were talking about football and uh, wrestling being a sport of uh, combat sport mentally. Uh, back to kind of the crazy people on the edge. Can you talk about uh, how training, if you were in our shoes building, I hate this word, but mental toughness. Uh, what uh, Could you go into that a little bit, how your training reflects that? I hate mental, the word mental toughness too because there's two people, the kind of people in this world, prey and predator. You better find out which one you are. And uh, But if you did, I would cut the rest periods down. I'd make the workouts more intense by cutting rest periods down. You know, I'd take them out here and make them do I could kick anyone's ass at batting, James. They won't even go out there. They won't even go out there. And people say, why do I do it? I said, because I can. <laughs> but I could get in a mental state where nothing, you know. I take a lot of pain. Uh, and I've always been that way. I was born that way. I don't think I was made that way. I, mean, I was made, uh, I was fighting in the first grade, kicked out for fighting. 14 years old, I had a restraining order for, for violent behavior. So I, I was just naturally that way. As I got older, and actually, weights gave me some self esteem. They honestly did. And it, it, weights helped me not just gave me self esteem, you know. I mean, I could kick weights ass, but I found they, they kicked my ass a lot more than I could kick their ass. Yeah, um, mental toughness, it's a. Um, I've always had someone to explain it to me, and they never can from a scientific standpoint. Yeah, because you can. <laughs> uh, a spinoff on that, just since we're talking about wrestling, and our wrestling coach definitely wants the guy's mental toughness uh, increase, but they also need a lot of a lot of increases in their strength. Do you think if you sh we talked a little bit about rest periods? Do you think if you shorten down the rest period, you're cutting into their strength? Uh, well, they have to be explosive. That well, they you know wrestling is quasi isometric. For a lot, oh. you know, they got to have it all. Just like, you know, faith, wrestling has to have a lot of quasi-isometric strength when they're grappling and they're pommeling. Uh, but um, what I would do, I would have them outside with the sleds. You guys went out the sleds, uh, where they're 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 getting stronger when they're running air through their body, and a lot you you did a lot of it. It's tough stuff, but you get your condition when they're getting stronger. You don't have time to con for a conditioning hour and as a strength hour. Put combine them with sleds. They don't have to lift weights. They say Matt Hughes. I know everybody would know who Matt Hughes is. I know guys that know him and said in weights he's not very strong, but on a mat he's incredibly strong. And the same way with the guys come here, not very strong with weights, but they grab onto them, they're incredibly strong. 170, 185 pounders, just, you know, just strong. You know, you talk about, um, I know a lot of things, you know, like, uh, Phil Jackson, he talks about having his players read books, if, if he can read, you know. But I do think you should read books. And I think whatever it takes, a movie, if a movie, I can watch, a, I like real good martial arts movies like um, and a Shogun Assassin. I like movies like that because I want to leave, I want to kill somebody. If I watch a fight to this day and it gets over one, I have to leave my house and drive around for an hour. All right? I like, the, I like revenge. I like The Call of the Wild. You ever read The Call of the Wild? No, no. Read The Call of the Wild <laughs> about Buck the dog. Goes up and realizes, you know, he's a big St. Bernard, and, and he's, he gets in, he gets lost, he gets in with a wolf pack, and he saw a dog get down, and when that dog got down, all the other wolves jumped on him and killed it. So he realized, first thing I better do is never get down. Well, then he became the, the leader of the wolf pack. And, uh, you know, he's in the wild, he was the ass kicker. And as soon as he went back, and then he found his way back home, and he got back home, and he's on the farm, and he's thinking back, man, you know, how rough it was for him, and he's just trotting through the field. And this big uh, bitch of a dog comes up, you know, it's a big female, knocks his ass over. And he goes, got to think about it. Like, this girl knocked me over. If I was in the woods, I'd be dead right now. And that's, people ask me uh, why I hang out in the worst parts of town in Columbus, because that's where I grew up. And it always, there's always that fear factor, keep my eye open. I like, I don't want nobody's ever going to get a jump on me. I and mean, uh, that's why I do that. And uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, a simple little elementary book. About seagulls. You ever read Jonathan Livingston Seagull? No. Nope. Well, it's about, you know, seagulls aren't supposed to fly fast, right? But this guy just wanted to fly. Just like, you know, you ain't supposed to lift weight. You're fine. What are you doing that for? So Jonathan's trying to dive. He, his feathers get screwed up in the wreck because they ain't made to dive. And uh, he got where he'd do 100, 150, and all of a sudden. The, the, but the elders kept saying, if you don't learn to be a seagull, we're kicking you out. Well, I got kicked out. So um, he got better and better and better. And he thought he was the man. You know, I forgot how fast he could dive. And, uh, but he thought he was a man. He's on the beach one day, and he sees a gull down at the end, a silver gull. It was glowing silver. And he looked at the gull, and all of a sudden the gull was sitting next to him. And he goes, how did you do that? 
And he goes, um, perfect speed. And he goes, what's perfect speed? He said, perfect speed is being there. You know, if you take anabolic steroids, it has to work in the brain before it works in anything. To stimulate the brain, to stimulate the body. And that's why when I lift weights to this day, when I look at a heavy deadlift, because there's nothing going to cooperate with a deadlift, right? You, I look at it, I, I never, I use a Zen state, I've done Tai Chi since 1970, but I look at that bar, and the only thing I know, it's there, and it's going to be locked out. There's no fight to that bar. That's how I, that's how I operate. And I think that's how good people operate. They, they, they operate instinctively. You know, you don't see intellectuals on a football field. You know, they're in the laboratories. I'm not saying you can be dumb to be on a football field. Right. I'm just saying you can't think your way through it. You've got to react your way through it. Like defensive players react better than offensive players. Is that true? You have to react to the play because you got to hit start on them. Mm -hmm. Same Yes, uh, as you look back at your career, what has been the one of the, give us some of the best lessons you've learned. Um, I know it's been a ton, I'm sure, but if you could just give us one thing that stands out in your mind. Okay, well, one, you know, you know, you guys know me, and I, like I said, I'll, I'll say anything for the Pope, I could care less. I got my opinions because, uh, because I've done it all wrong, and I had to revert. No one was going to fix me but me. And uh, really, the lessons... Um, one, be, be surround yourself with good people. Never, if you run with the lame, you develop a limp. If you got somebody bad on the team, you get them the hell off the team. I don't care who it is. And uh, that's one thing. And, um, you know, and by, I started constantly lifting. I started power. I Olympic lifted first, and I'll be straight up with you. I Olympic lifted until 1966 when I was a kid. And I was getting drafted in the Army right out of high school at, at 19, when I was 18. I went to a power meet. And there was 11 guys in my weight class. I beat one guy. He's 55 years old. And I saw guys. I saw Vince Anello, Larry Pacifico, Melton McKinney, and George Crawford. These all four of these guys became world champions and built like I'd never seen anyone built. And I go, this is my sport. I went, in the Olympic lifting contest, I got first, second, or third ever I went. I beat a guy 55 years old. I come in 10 out of 11. I go, this is my sport. That's why I realized how much stronger they were and, and the a different attitude they had, even in 1966. And, uh, and the greatest thing I ever learned is in 1983, after breaking my back for the second time, I'm sitting in my house saying what went wrong. And I go, what? I, I couldn't even figure it out. But I thought, well, Olympic lifters are explosive, so let me see what they're doing. I got all the books I could from overseas. And I realized I had gotten stronger, but I didn't lift anymore because I'd gotten slower. That's just a mathematic formula for disaster. So I started doing speed work, and when I got my speed up, all my lifts took off. I mean, I was already old. And uh, I did my greatest lifts actually over 50 years old. I mean, at, at 52, I was ranked fourth in the open world, third in the squat. At 54, I was sixth in the bench. At 57, I pulled 715 deadlift. Uh, that was 13th, tied for, um, it was a 715, it was tied for 10, but they beat me on time. And uh, I'm 63, I just pulled 675 deadlift. I'm still total elite longer than anyone ever from um, uh, February 73 to current day, longer than anybody alive. But the, the key was going to the Soviets. I thought I knew what I was doing. I knew nothing what I was doing. I applied science to weight training. That happened in 1983, and I constantly making us better. Like our gym does the scene this, where most sports slow down at the top. Ours seems to be accelerating. We learn more and more. I got better athletes, stronger athletes, and I'm learning more from my athletes how to make a better athlete. Uh, it was one day, I forgot when we were talking about training. Uh, the timed sets, I've read a lot of your yes. time sets, uh, especially you've done a lot with throwers and stuff, and we were talking at uh, lunch about how, on average, uh, guys will gain 20 to 40 pounds in, in here. Um, so for athletes, uh, they need to put on a little bit of muscle mass. Uh, could you go about how you do those, uh, talk about those for a little bit? All right, I got this. I believe it came from Corella. And I think he told uh, Alexis, who worked with... Uh, Pizarinko, is that how you pronounce it? Pizarinko. Yeah, okay. And what they would do, they would do Olympic lifts from one to three minutes at a time. Never put the bar on the ground. So while I adopted it, I adapted it to uh, powerlifting and grappling, where we'll squat for five minutes, three to five if you can do it. And But dumbbell presses, for instance, up to 15 minutes. It's real slow. Like if you box squat, you sit on a box, you can sit there all you want. It's like you on my shoulders. Stand up, sit down, stand up, do a couple good mornings. Go halfway, stop, go on down, sit down, 
And um, that builds amazing endurance and builds amazing amount of muscular conditioning and size. And that's where I got it from. Alexis, uh, you know, if you read in, uh, uh, you know, a science of sports training, sometimes we'll do 100 snatches with uh, 100K. Do 1,000 steps in the waiting pool. I do the same thing in my hot tub. I get into a hundred course of leg curl in a pool. It was a leg extension, you know, and I'll do three to five hundred stuff like that because of having the knee problems I had. They're fine, but uh, I do a lot of conditioning stuff like that. I realized I got older. I had to do more. People think they do less. You have to do more. But the time sets are is tremendous, and it's basically for grappling uh, in sports, ball sports, gets you in good shape, builds you up. Just like if, you, if I put a 125-pound weight vest on those ankle weights, send you out here for a couple miles, when you take that off, you feel like you can fly, literally fly. Mm -hmm. But your conditioning is its way up. And, you know, if you read experts, say walking will not increase any sport, even speed walking. Well, they obviously never did it with resistance because all the guys love it. I'm only telling you what they tell, back, they tell me. And, and just, uh, I want to bring up one more thing about the speed squats for explosive, you know, you're working on uh, explosive muscular power, the speed pulls, and then, of course, the power for conditioning and the, and the power walking to build muscular strength in the posterior chain. And backwards, I showed you many ways. But the box jump, how do I never take a ball player when they come here? I never run them. How do I know if they run faster? If they jump higher, they run faster. Take that from any top sprint coach and they'll say the same thing. That's how I do it. If they jump higher, it's, it's, it's straight up. They run faster. Because I don't want to run. I just don't want to run a kid in the ground. I think they practice. I mentioned before, you know, I got, this is my observation. I never played the game. and um, uh, But I, I told them, football, I've never seen a, a game that's practiced supposedly so many hours and played a very few minutes with the ratio of errors per minute. They make more errors than any sport I've ever seen with the amount that they practice versus the minutes that they play. And to me, it's just overdone. It's a law of accommodation. They do the same thing over and over and over. The only way you eventually can only get worse, you can't get better. I think you got all you guys, you got offensive players on defensive teams and vice versa, right? Just for different stimulus. Same kind. I do a lot of stimulating training like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of drills and not, you know, a lot of drills, but not so much running and stuff like that. Well, we really appreciate your time, this experience has yeah. been great for us, and we look forward to staying in contact with you. Thank well, you so much. Yeah, I appreciate you guys coming over, really. Oh, and, you know, I mean, I tell you, I only tell you what I say because uh, I've seen it work, and, and I got too many injuries. I don't want people to be hurt. I don't want people, when you're hurt, you don't make progress. Mm -hmm. And so many people quit. I'm just one of the dummies mm -hmm. that never quit. We forgot to talk about uh, box squats and the uh, safety behind them. We need to cover that. <laughs> we do need to cover that. All right. Box squatting. <laughs> it's the greatest method of explosive power training and the safest of any. If you watch a guy squat without a box, do your players got lousy form without a box? They normally got terrible form. As the weights get heavier, you squat higher and higher. Well, a box, if, this is a, if I want a person to squat to this depth on a box, thousand squats later, you're squatting to this depth. But I want to show you how to box squat. <laughs> box squatting, I have a good, if you can see the scar, I have a complete rupture patella tendon. I tore it off at 91. And I didn't lift for five years. I trained but didn't lift. And I came back, I had an 821 squat. I was a top 10 squatter in five weight classes. I, after, um, after five years, in 96, I came out of retirement and, and in 2000, or 97, but in 2001 or two or something, I squatted 920, which I said was the third best squat, over 50 years old. All box squatting. Um, another guy, he's a, we used to tour with the Roman, or with the Greco Roman team, uh, Greco wrestling Roman t uh, team, and he, uh, he had a seven, you know, um, Jim Hoskinson, mm -hmm. 744 squat, and he hurt himself doing power cleans, and I mean, it's just the way it goes, tore his uh, patellas, both patellas, and ripped the quadriceps tennis. I got him to box squat, I first pulled a sled, got him to box squat. Five months, he squatted 500, I said, that's good, because that's what I did. Nine months, he had a 744, all-time best squat. Nine months, he came up here from Florida and squatted 890. A couple years later, he squatted 1107, all box squat. No injuries to his knee. Box squatting is a leg curl. When you squat, you stick, your, you stick your glutes out, set on the box, so your shin is passed straight up and down. The only way you can get up is the leg curl out of there. Always drive your feet out. You never drive your feet down. Boom. Just like that. It involves all hip, 
uh, you know, hip, glute, and hamstring, and abdominal muscles. As long as you have air, I've been in experiments um, at Ohio State University, why people wear belts. People wear belts, but did they really know? When you wear a belt, it, um, it increases uh, abdominal pressure, decreases spinal pressure. All right, so when you sit on a box, it all in the abs. It has nothing to do with your spine. If your back hurts, what do you do? You go sit down. Well, I guess these people, these experts are telling you never sit down. Just stand up the rest of your life. And But the first squatter, Pat Casey 800, picture behind me, Raw, 1970. I just watched, what's his name? Wilkerson? Yeah, Wilkerson. Probably. Wilkerson, squat a thousand, Raw, box squatter, you know, all time record. Uh, the biggest squats in the world, 1260, 1250. Jeff Lewis, 1212. All of our guys were all box squatters. As a whole, we got the greatest group of squatters ever, and we're all box squatters. Box squats the safest way. Train two Olympic gold medals, sprinters, box squat. Box squat's the best way to train. Makes you more explosive. You know, when you. I want you to think like this in common sense. When you squat, you've got the body's got so much energy to lower itself, stop itself momentarily, and, and raise itself. Box squatting, you can break that up. That's why you break up these centric concentric chains. I can lower myself, sit down, gather myself, and come up. You cannot do that in a regular squat. You only got so much energy. All right, that's all I got to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>